I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco and for Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, opening statements. Lawyers for T-Mobile and Sprint head to court Monday to fend off an antitrust challenge from 13 states and the District of Columbia. We'll have details. Plus, cleanup crew Goldman Sachs now arranging a massive line of credit to help revive one of SoftBank's biggest bets, WeWork. We'll have the latest. And muted returns. The TV industry suffers its deepest drop in ad sales since economic recession of 2009. What that means for streaming. But first, to our top story. The challenge to T-Mobile's $26 billion Sprint merger took shape in a New York courtroom on Monday. The coalition of 13 states and the District of Columbia is suing to block the deal. The trial is expected to last about three weeks. With the latest, it is Bloomberg Intelligence's Jennifer Ree, who was in the courtroom. Jennifer, I just have to ask, day one, what's your big takeaway? Well, I'll tell you, Taylor, you know, day one started with a surprise because the judge basically opened everything and said, hey, we're not going to have opening statements. I read enough in the pretrial memoranda. That's good enough. Let's go straight to the witnesses. So I think that was a big surprise, particularly for the lawyers that's probably spent a lot of time preparing those. Um, but the judge is really intent on getting this trial done in two weeks, not the full three weeks that some think it might take. And I, this was part of that uh, to get things moving along quickly. So we got right into the first witness. Um, and basically got through two and a half for the day. And I think overall, uh, the witnesses were actually pretty good and better than I thought they'd be for the companies. Uh, there, there, was, there were some bad documents um, that were introduced with the first witness, and, you know, it's only two witnesses and the start of a third, so it's early to say what that really means. But generally, I thought the day was pretty good for the companies. Uh, Jennifer, I want to talk about one of those witnesses. We got a headline that Roger Soule, Sprint's mm -hmm. chief marketing officer, said in a text message in 2016, 2017 that he would think that this merger would raise prices by about $5 on average per subscriber. Is it too early to tell if that helps or hurts, given this is a two-week process? You know, Taylor, I think that was the worst of the day for the companies in terms of this deal. Those were bad documents um, where Roger Soleil, the chief marketing officer, did suggest to other executives at Sprint that maybe what they could use as part of their negotiating tactic with T-Mobile to get a better price was that the deal would mean an increase of possibly $5 a month in average per subscriber, um, and that there weren't, that T-Mobile wasn't taking that into account when they were evaluating uh, what they would pay for Sprint. He did do a decent job in trying to play this down. Uh, it is a very damaging document in terms of the company's case. He said, look, this is just a hypothetical. I didn't do any real studies here. I was just guessing. And, you know, hey, I'm just a marketing guy, and this is the way marketers think. And, in fact, he didn't really think that that was something that was used as part of the negotiation. But I would say that was probably the most damaging part of the trial today for the companies. Bloomberg's Jennifer Reed covering day one of what could be a long two to three weeks. Thank you for joining us. And with more on the case and really what's at stake for the wireless industry, it is Harry First. He's a law professor at NYU in New York. Harry, first, are you surprised that this is going to trial? Uh, well, no, uh, given the way the case is set up, but in general, uh, this is a very unusual case uh, to go to trial by the states, not by the federal government. Harry, I was reading uh, one of your documents on this case, and you were writing about how a critical question for you really is how the judge treats the Justice Department's proposed final judgment. Why is that critical for you? Well, um, there are two aspects. One is the states are going to have to prove that this merger actually will uh, or um, might lessen competition, particularly by raising price. So the testimony that was referred to earlier um, is a critical aspect of that. Uh, but the second part is th the Justice Department, in a separate uh, filing, um, has agreed that uh, this merger will raise prices by billions of dollars, it says, but has come up with a remedy. So if the remedy um, is sufficient to uh, reduce the competitive effect or to make it not anti-competitive, 
um, that could be and presumably will be a strong defense by the parties. But um, the, the plaintiff states uh, certainly are going to argue that even if that remedy goes into effect, which it has not yet, uh, that that is not enough um, to reduce the anti-competitive effect of going from a market with four major competitors to three. Harry, are they able to say that given the merger goes through, they're actually still only number two? Verizon is still ahead of them. Does that help them when they're presenting their competition claim? Not a bit. So um, there's less competition. The fact that there is some competition, you might say, well, that's nice. Uh, we don't want to have monopoly. But the antitrust laws don't say we wait until we get a monopoly and then we stop. Congress said we stop before then. We want to stop mergers that will lessen competition, uh, not necessarily create a monopoly, but will create less competition. So it's never been a defense that, hey, guess what? Um, there's someone bigger than we are in the market, uh, so there's still some competition left. Professor, I want to take a look at a chart that I'm showing to my audience inside the Bloomberg terminal here. And what we're showing is basically since the proposed merger was announced, T-Mobile shares are off the highs and Sprint shares have reacted much poorly. They're now negative going back on a one-year basis. This was leading to a lot of analysts to speculate that we could see a settlement given that the states really have a, a relatively good case. Uh, would you look for a settlement? If so, what does a potential settlement look like? Well, that's, that is always a problem in these cases of figuring out a settlement. Settlement's supposed to restore competition to what it would otherwise have been. Now, if there were a settlement like that available, um, maybe the Justice Department would have proposed it and the parties would have agreed to it. Uh, but this goes back to um, what we talked about earlier, that the settlement that was taken um, is, um, from the state's point of view, inadequate. And frankly, Given the arguments about why this reduces competition, it is very hard to see what a settlement would look like. So I expect the states to litigate this um, to the end. Uh, there's, uh, you can always be surprised. But I think what the states are saying is uh, just say no. Uh, this merger is anti-competitive and can't be cured. We can't create uh, another sprint. We have one. Let's have it compete. Does this case have any broader implications for Trump's antitrust policies? Well, I think in some ways this is a test of how the Trump administration is proceeding uh, with uh, antitrust policy. So this administration has taken a pretty aggressive position with regard to any other enforcement agency um, having some different view than the Justice Department. So there has have always been differences among the various enforcers between the states and the federal government, the FTC, and the Justice Department. But this Justice Department has been particularly vigorous in intervening in cases in which other enforcers have different views. It's not just the states, um, and that's why I say this case is a little unusual to have the states out front litigating this while the Justice Department is settling. The Justice Department has also intervened against the Federal Trade Commission in an important uh, technology case involving Qualcomm. It's intervened in private cases to assert its views. It's been very aggressive in this way in wanting to control um, what antitrust should look like. So in general, we have the states in some ways going one way, uh, particularly New York and California, major states, and the federal government going in a somewhat different way. Thank you to Harry First. He's a law professor at NYU. And coming up, another potential deal on the horizon. Xerox tries to sell its plan for Hewlett Packard to HP shareholders. We'll have the details of the pitch next. This is Bloomberg. Xerox is dangling carrots in front of HP shareholders. At a recent presentation, Xerox said that the tie-up of the two companies could create as much as $1.5 billion in potential revenue growth. With details, it is Bloomberg's Nico Grant. Nico, do the math for me here. You combine two companies. How are you getting $1.5 billion of future revenue growth? So Xerox is saying in this presentation to HP investors that on a pro forma basis, the combined revenue of the two companies as things stand today 
today would be about $66.8 billion, uh, with HP contributing $58 billion of that total. But it's also saying that due to a tie-up, there are certain products of HPs that could be sold through Xerox and certain efficiencies that can be made, and they can unlock $1.5 billion of, of additional revenue. The problem is, with a company that large, um, you know, when you're already at almost $70 billion, is $1.5 billion enough to convince those who may be skeptical of such a deal? And it also didn't really answer the question of whether revenue uh, increases over the midterm or long term would be possible in a declining industry. That's where I'm going next. Revenue growth, synergies, it sounds great. Is it realistic? Mm -hmm. So Xerox would say, yes, it is realistic. They've been uh, crunching the math, and they have found that um, right now, HP is selling a lot of its computers and its printers uh, through either direct sales to large customers or through indirect channels, uh, which means basically resellers, computer resellers. And Xerox has a whole team of folks who sell to small and mid-sized businesses. So they're saying, wait, we can sell your PCs to our existing customers. We can have your uh, products sold through our as a service or subscription offerings. And we can also have manufacturing efficiencies, supply chain efficiencies, basically fire a lot of people. We can also reduce reduce the number of vendors and suppliers that we have, and they're really making an argument that it is rational. Um, and right now the question is, will it be enough for HP shareholders to convince the company or force the company to do something? And some of these are company specific issues. A lot of this, frankly, is a structural change going on in the market where they are facing a structural declining in that printing business. Are they prepared to take on the structural change that's underway. Mm -hmm. So Xerox has been sort of managing decline for a long time. Mm -hmm. HP has to a, a certain extent, you know, these are both businesses that know uh, that your know, markets are shrinking, particularly in printing. HP got into a lot of trouble this year with investors, which opened the door to Xerox because ink supplies uh, started to fall and contract. The, I think, problem, uh, some would say, in this deal is that uh, this would make a combined entity uh, more subject to the winds of the printing industry, which is contracting much more than the PC industry. HP right now gets most of its revenue from PCs, a business that Xerox isn't in. And so I think what you would see is that if the entities combined, um, revenue would shrink at some point, but Xerox is arguing that it's better to take control in uh, this type of situation because the first movers who consolidate will have more power than the other companies that are left over, like Canon, like Rico, et cetera. The debate continues. Thank you to Bloomberg's Nico Grant. And now to the continuing saga to save WeWork. Goldman Sachs is playing a part in keeping the embattled office co-sharing startup afloat. The bank will arrange a line of credit for almost $1.8 billion. It's the first step in SoftBank's pledge to put together a $5 billion in debt financing for WeWork as part of the bailout. According to sources, SoftBank will be listed as the borrower and WeWork will be the co-borrower. Joining us from New York, it is Bloomberg's Jillian Tan, who's been covering this story. Jillian, what is $1.8 billion in the scheme of the saga of WeWork? Yeah, so it's obviously going to be very meaningful to WeWork, a company that lost $1.3 billion in the third quarter. So um, if you think of the credit financing, it's definitely a line that uh, WeWork needs. This $1.75 billion, it's in letters of credit, and then uh, the company is going to receive $3.3 billion in additional secured and unsecured notes. But that's a second stage of the, the financing. What are they hoping to do with a new line of credit? It's, it's unclear. I think it would be for general working capital purposes for ongoing growth into markets. The company has said that it intends to sort of continue expanding in its 12 key markets, which include New York and London, um, and it'll continue to take on leases in those uh, cities. But in some of their other cities, I think that they've been clear that they're going to move towards a management agreement type structure, which really reduces their lease liabilities. For now, though, it's, you know, they need the cash to meet their ongoing burdens. 
I want to take a look at a chart that I'm showing here inside my terminal, Jillian, which actually shows an improving picture in turquoise. It is the bonds of WeWork maturing in 2025, falling down as bond price up, yield down below a 13 handle. You're yielding 12.8% or so. Uh, are investors pleased with the small turnaround and tweaks and changes we've been seeing from this company in the last three months or so? Yeah, so today even just our story that Goldman's involved in this new financing actually sent the bonds up um, four cents on the dollar, I think, so more than four percent. And as you can see, um, it's sort of creeping out of distress level a little bit. Bondholders are feeling a little bit more comfortable that the company is salvageable, that SoftBank is putting its money where its mouth is, that gradually the $9.5 billion rescue package is actually coming together. So far, SoftBank has accelerated a $1.5 billion equity injection and it's also um, started a $3 billion tender offer. When that's done, SoftBank's stake in WeWork will actually rise to about 80%. Um, and then from there on that $5 billion in credit financing, which this $1.75 billion letters of credit portion is part of, that'll sort of shore up the company for, I guess, the near future. Uh, Jillian, does this give you any indication that SoftBank is looking to share the burden, if you will, and not go all in alone? Uh, it's not so much as sharing the burden, it's just more putting its name behind the company that it is going to be the major owner of. So by signing on as the borrower and having WeWork as the co-borrower, it takes away some of the risk that credit providers, banks, lenders might have um, hesitance in terms of lending to just WeWork on its own. SoftBank sort of stepping up behind them, saying, you know what, we're here, we're the fallback, we're willing to put our name right alongside WeWork. It was just notable to me that it was Goldman Sachs coming through with a potential line of credit. And I know a few months ago when we were looking at bailout options for WeWork along with the South Bay plan, it was also looking at a deal with J.P. Morgan. Any thoughts of why Goldman versus J.P. Morgan? Yeah, so that's a very good observation. Uh, the Jamie Dimon-led bank is known to have been close to Adam Newman. Adam is out now. So... SoftBank is, I guess, in charge. They're, I guess, closer to Goldman. So that, that's sort of what we read as to why JP Morgan isn't front and centre on this one. Bloomberg's Jillian Tan, thank you for joining. And speaking of WeWork, co-founder and former CEO Adam Newman is looking to sell one of his Manhattan residences. Newman bought four units in a seven-story building in New York City's Gramercy neighborhood. He's looking to sell two units that he combined into one. He paid nearly $28 million for those apartments. And coming up, Jedi, Mind Tricks. Amazon says that that prize Pentagon Jedi contract that Microsoft won was because CEO Jeff Bezos is viewed as President Trump's enemy. More on all of that next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at Quick Take on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Shares of Datadog, they're lower in trading on Monday. A special provision was triggered allowing insiders and early IPO investors to sell 20% of locked up shares. Datadog just went public in September. The remaining locked up shares are now eligible to be sold next March. And back to a story I was following, Apple is returning to the annual CES tech conference for the first time in decades. This time with consumer privacy on the agenda, Jane Horvath, that's the company's senior director of privacy, will take the stage with executives from Facebook and P&G, as well as a commissioner from the FTC. Horvath and the other panelists will discuss regulation, consumer demands, and how companies build privacy at scale. Apple hasn't attended CES in an official capacity since 1992. Now, Amazon's fight to challenge Microsoft's Jedi win continues. The e-commerce giant claims that the Pentagon failed to fairly judge its contract bid because President Trump views Jeff Bezos as a political enemy. Amazon Web Services seeks to reopen the $10 billion cloud deal in the lawsuit. Joining us to discuss, it is Bloomberg's Naomi Nix in Washington, D.C. Uh, Naomi, what do we know so far about the he said, she said? <laughs> Um, well, Amazon is essentially contending that uh, not only did the Pentagon err in evaluate, evaluating its bid, that those errors were made because President Donald Trump meddled. Uh, and they said, look, it's not clear, you know, how much the Pentagon uh, took 
uh, the Trump's comments into consideration when it gave the award uh, to Microsoft. But it is definitely clear um, that those comments were out there and that the Pentagon couldn't have ignored them. And so it's really, it's, it is going to come out to a he said, she said. Did, uh, we know that Trump has made critical comments about Amazon and the Jedi Cloud contract. The question the courts will have to decide, of course, is if those comments actually influenced uh, the Pentagon's decision making. Naomi, is there an actual chance that this gets overturned or reopened? <laughs> These kind of cases are tough to prove um, because not only does Amazon have to prove that the Pentagon was aware of that, you know, Trump's been very critical of Amazon and of uh, Jeff Bezos in particular and his ownership of the Washington Post. Uh, but it's not going to be enough for Amazon to just prove that Trump has a longtime animosity against Amazon or Jeff Bezos. They're going to have to prove uh, that as the Pentagon was making those uh, evaluations of Microsoft's bid and Amazon's bid, that you know, they were taking Trump's comments into consideration rather than establishing a, a winner based on, on, the, on the merits. As you've been covering this, any precedents that could be set to pave the way for this case? This is an unusual case. It's not <laughs> common uh, that a sitting president uh, would be on record openly questioning uh, whether a bid was fair. Remember, back in July, uh, Trump really surprised the industry and the procurement world by saying, I've been hearing complaints from Oracle and Microsoft and IBM about whether this deal was structurally fair. And I'm, I'm going to, uh, you know, ask the Pentagon to order up a review. And the Pentagon, you know, as soon as he was confirmed, uh, Secretary Esper said, I'm going to be looking at this uh, taking another look at this procurement. And so this is a really unusual case that this procurement has gotten this controversial um, and involves a sitting president. Normally, there, you know, these things aren't done uh, in quite such a public and, and controversial manner. Bloomberg's Naomi Nix, thank you for joining us. And coming up, world leaders are trying to teach tax big tech. Will the U.S. stand in the way of a global digital tax plan coming online? That's next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology Global Link, where we join Bloomberg Daybreak Australia to bring you the latest in global tech news. I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco with Sherry Ann in New York and Paul Allen in Sydney. Let's take a look at those top global tech stories of the day. Paul? Thanks, Taylor. The world's fourth largest smartphone maker is making its move in Japan. Xiaomi is entering the Japanese market with a budget-friendly smartphone and a connected fitness tracker. The company is making its MyNote 10 Android smartphone available for immediate pre-order, with shipments starting December 16th. Xiaomi will face a tough challenge in Japan, where the market is shrinking and dominated by Apple. And speaking of Apple, what was once a routine corporate espionage case now involves surface-to-air missiles. The U.S. says an Apple engineer accused of stealing trade secrets for a Chinese startup also was in possession of files for the Patriot missile program. These missile documents, which belong to his former employer Raytheon, are not permitted to be taken outside of Department of Defense secured locations. And finally, the Chinese government is taking further steps to remove foreign technology from state agencies and other organizations. Beijing will likely replace as many as 20 million computers at government agencies with domestic products over the next three years. That's according to a report from China Securities. The move for this increased technological independence comes amid escalating trade tensions with the U.S. And those are the top global tech stories we're watching. Sherry.
Paul, thank you. And now to a story we've been following, the global digital tax debate. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has outlined a plan to overhaul global tax rules, but the U.S. has some reservations. The U.S. wants companies to have a choice to fully opt in or out of part of the plan, which is, of course, driven by concerns that big tech companies aren't paying enough in taxes or in the right countries. For more, let's head to Capitol Hill in Washington, where our corporate tax reporter Laura Davison is standing by. Laura, so explain to us this safe harbor proposal suggested by Secretary Mnuchin. What is the U.S. concerned about here? So what the plan would do that the OECD has put out is to say that instead of what the current system where companies pay tax where they earn the income, so if they earn it in the U.S., they pay the income there. If they earn it in China or France or India, they pay the tax there, is they're saying they will pay taxes where their users are, which could vary differently from where their headquarters are and where their operations are. So the U.S. has said, okay, this is fine, but we want this to make, to make this optional. Um, and the reason here that the U.S. wants to do this is because they, they, they believe that uh, if companies have a choice, they might be paying more taxes in the, the, in the U.S. versus in other countries. So this is very much a play to sort of keep the U.S. tax base within the arms of the IRS. Laura, big tech sort of wanted a cohesive plan because it's much easier to follow as your business planning and preparing what countries in which to do business. Uh, does this even solve the problem or also create more fusion because it's sort of an opt-in, opt-out? Yes, this could definitely uh, create uh, more confusion for companies, for their accountants to figure out, one, you have to basically have to run two calculations and see which, which is the better deal. Two, it also opens up opportunities for companies to play a lot of games and, and run the numbers, uh, come up with a different case scenario. So there's certainly a lot of work for tax lawyers and accountants here, but, uh, but probably not good for, for those who are going to be after auditing this, as well as for the, the, comp or for the countries to figure out you know, what, what their tax base is going to look like. We know that the French don't like the U.S. proposal. Could other countries, though, like it? Uh, that's certainly possible. You look at uh, the countries where they have a lot of consumers, but maybe not a lot of operations. So think about India, China. Uh, France is also one of these countries uh, where they say, look, we, we have an opportunity to get more tax revenue with this OECD plan. We want to stick with that. We don't want to give people an opportunity to opt out of this. Um, so this is really the, a key sticking point going forward. This is one of the first uh, big roadblocks we've seen in these negotiations going forward. Uh, you know, it's not just U.S. and France at the table. There's, you know, 130 countries total. Uh, so uh, that, that's going to be um, an issue that they... Uh, are going to face as they head forward uh, in the next year or so. They're hoping to, co to come up with a deal about by this time next year. Laura, you and Sherry are smartly bringing up France as they seem to be leading the way on this. I want you to react to a soundbite. I spoke with Cedric o, who runs the digital affairs over in France. Take a listen. It wants a tax on digital companies uh, that, that is adapted to that new framework and that it is favoring the OECD solution, but would, not, would it not be uh, adapted, then it would go for a European solution. And I think that we need to, to create that level playing field. The best level is at the international level, but if, uh, if the American don't want to go for that solution, then we will go for a European one. Laura Sedrigo basically saying there, if they don't get an OECD solution, they'll just create a European solution. Where are we in the midst of multiple solutions? Well, this is, this is really the big question. What the U.S. does not want is for there to be a, a bunch of different solutions. Right now, you have com uh, countries like France, uh, Canada, New Zealand, who are all coming up with their own taxes. Having an EU-specific solution would be better for the U.S., but really the best solution, and what the U.S. wants, is to have this, this global solution. The question, though, is, is if they can uh, agree to some of the, the terms which the negotiating partners are bringing to the table, uh, and that's really uh, where we're going to see if this can be done, which um, it would be, uh, it's going to be difficult to get that done, though the U.S. Uh, Treasury officials are confident that they can reach some sort of agreement. What do the tech companies want, Laura? Well, they uh, haven't publicly said yet what they specifically want. They have agreed that they want this, this multilateral deal. They want something that um, is easier to follow. But they also are very concerned that they could end up paying more in taxes once a deal is reached. So they're, they're really looking at uh, you know, both simplicity as well as you know, what makes dollars and cents for them. Thank you to Bloomberg's Laura Davison. Plenty more global stories ahead. This is Bloomberg. A follow-up to the story about the widely mocked ad for Peloton.
The commercial about a young wife getting a Peloton exercise bike for the holidays struck some as being sexist, insensitive, and out of touch. Now the actress in the ad has a new gig. Monica Ruiz is in a commercial for Aviation Gin, sitting at a bar with two friends. They tell her she's safe there, and they toast to new beginnings. Actor Ryan Reynolds is one of the gin's owners, and he posted the ad on Twitter with the caption, exercise bike not included. It is a bad year for the global TV ad industry. TV ad sales fell almost 4% in 2019. That's the steepest drop since the recession a decade ago, signaling that advertisers are following viewers to the internet. But there are some winners emerging from this market change. Joining us to discuss Dallas Lawrence, advisor at the marketing technology company Channel Factory in Los Angeles. Dallas, I wonder if we're not surprised the fact that we're migrating from TV to internet, but perhaps what's surprising is the rate of change at which TV advertising is really falling off a cliff. I think what we're seeing is, is just the maturation of television advertising as it's now the dollars are now finally following the consumer eyeballs as they migrate away from linear television to really streaming television. What we know today is that six out of 10 US adults stream and they stream a lot. The average streamer watches twice as much streaming content as they do linear television content. And that doesn't even take into account the 42% of U.S. adults that say they either are going to cut the cord or have already. If you just look at the holiday shopping season we're in right now, which is a marketer's target-rich environment, fully a third of consumers say they'll watch zero live television during the holiday season. So the real challenge for marketers who still spend 95% of their TV budgets in these linear television channels is beginning to is beginning to become very aware as those dollars are now moving to where the streamers are going and there's going to be some winners and losers. Dallas, that is a fascinating statistic to me. You are going to watch zero ads of live TV, zero hours of live TV this holiday season. Is that a new statistic? It is. It's a new survey that came out from the Harris Poll researching consumers that said that fully a third will watch zero live television. The races to watch that I think are really interesting, there are three ad races to watch here, I think, as we're trying to sum up who's going to be a winner here in the $75 billion ad race. You have the platform race, the content race, and the data race. On the platform side, I think clearly Roku is in the pole position to the number one smart TV operating system in the world. Hundreds of apps utilize the Roku platform to reach consumers, and Roku sells those ads uh, for those apps. Their advertising business is up 80% year over year. On the content side, you see a couple platforms like Hulu, which is owned by Disney, and Pluto TV, which is owned by Viacom, that have really leaned into the ad-supported model. A majority of consumers report preferring an ad-supported model versus kind of the Netflix subscription-based model, which is why you see Hulu, for example, 70% of their users uh, are ad supported. The last one, which I think is kind of the most interesting, gets the least amount of attention, and that's the data race that we're seeing unfold. Television advertising today is still largely bought and sold the way we've been doing it for 30 years, off of a few thousand set top boxes on Nielsen that are trying to extrapolate the behaviors of 300 million Americans across the most fragmented media environment we've ever seen. And marketers are saying that doesn't work. So you've begun seeing companies like Samba TV, for example. Samba the TV is a company that has their software on most television manufacturers' uh, devices. They're in 25 million televisions uh, across the world. It's able to provide real-time data for marketers, uh, breadth and depth that's never before been available, that's driving higher ROI uh, for those marketers. So if for no other reason, we're going to see ad dollars continue to migrate to streaming and to smart connected devices simply because they work better. Dallas, I want to break down three of those that you just touched on, one of which is Roku. If you take a look at a chart that I'm showing here inside my terminal, it is the stock of Roku and then the average analyst price target. The trend is up, but frankly, it has been a volatile story as investors really try to figure out what streaming wars mean for Roku. Do you believe that you cannot launch a streaming platform unless you also do it with Roku? I think Roku is the, is the un, undoubted winner here in the streaming wars as we think about what happens in, in the next couple of months and what's already happened in the last few months. If you just look at Disney Plus, for example, uh, Disney was seeing about a million downloads every single day of Disney Plus. During that same time frame, Roku downloads were up 50%. So people were actually going to get the Roku operating system so they could then access Disney Plus. So they are uniquely positioned in the ecosystem today to benefit from the eight to $10 billion in content that's gonna be spent because you need to watch it on a platform. Uh, Disney doesn't have a platform that you can watch it on, neither does Netflix. So you're gonna be going to your Roku device. If you've gone to a big box retailer, you've seen the Roku television. Uh, it's the number one TV operating system in the world. You can buy a 55 inch smart 4K TV 
for $200. They are, they're really in a, in a great position in the market today. You also talk about some of the winners from this, namely Hulu, which makes me wonder, is it a price or content? Do I like Hulu because it's $4, $5, $6 a month and not $15 a month? Or is it a content story? Well, I think Hulu, what they've done well is they're actually getting, they're having their cake and they're eating it too. They're offering the, the subscriber, they're offering the user either the subscription model that has no ads or the ad-based model. So the user is actually getting to pick and choose what they want. What we've seen from polling is that about 58% of U.S. consumers prefer an ad-supported model that gets them somewhere around 5 or $6 a month. And about 40% prefer a subscription-based model. Uh, the challenge here, we didn't talk about the losers, but I think the real challenge here is going to be for Netflix. Uh, I've said on this program before that I absolutely believe Netflix is going to have to introduce an advertising supported model. They've reached a saturation point in the United States with subscribers. They can't raise their price any higher with Disney undercutting them at less than half the price. Uh, so I think what Hulu's done very smartly is they've read the market. They understand there's an appetite for both and they've offered both. Oh, the streaming wars. I could do this all day long. Dallas Lawrence of Channel Factory. Thank you for joining us. Now for a weekly look at the future of work in our series, Work Shifting. And this week, you've, we've been diving into increasingly competitive software as a service market. The company called Customer, that's Customer with the K, just raised about $60 million in its Series E funding round. It's their fourth round of funding in just 18 months. And it's taking on big players like Salesforce and Zendesk and working with brands like Lossier and Rent the Runway and more. Joining us to explain how customer differentiates from its competitors, we're joined by CEO and co-founder Brad Birnbaum. Brad, with $60 million, do you take on new customers? Do you hire? What do you do next? We are, um, we're very focused on reimagining customer service. So we are expanding in many different ways. We are um, expanding in different verticals. We're doing incredibly well with retail. We're doing very well with gig economy type companies, very well with Internet of Things type companies. And uh, with the additional capital, we've already started to see some great traction internationally and are continuing to uh, double down on that effort. Brad, we hear software as a service thrown around a lot, AI thrown around a lot. Give me a real life example of how I would use your service and how it translates for the customer. Sure. So we've recently rolled out Customer IQ, which is our artificial intelligence and machine learning platform. Our customers are able to use the vast amounts of data that they provide us with amazing omni-channel support experiences to, um, to optimize the, these, the experience that they're able to provide. So as an example, they might be able to use machine learning for automated routing, or they might be able to use artificial intelligence and machine learning for suggesting responses or for chatbots to be able to decide how to best respond to customers without even needing an agent to help service them. So they're able to optimize those experiences. I want to talk about AI because we hear a lot about that and you've talked about AI really being able to help transform the customer experience. Is AI really all it's cracked up to be? Yeah, it's come a long way and we're starting to take tremendous benefit of it. Um, AI without data isn't all that useful, but because we are able to leverage the vast amounts of data we, we, have, uh, we, we are provided by our companies that work with us, we're able to do some really amazing things with it and we're just at the tip of the iceberg. How are you keeping customer data safe? Oh, there's many things we're doing. It's, uh, it's encrypted, we are HIPAA compliant, we are SOC 2 compliant, um, we, are, we, are, we follow GDPR and CCPA, all of the reg various regulations, um, and access to data is incredibly, uh, is incredibly protected within our systems, and we are rolling out our next generation of our CRM platform, which will further enhance who can see what, who could do what, and how we're further in pr uh, protecting the data for our customers. You talk a lot about AI being able to measure sentiment of a brand. How are you doing that? Um, well, there's a lot of great tools out there that we are able to take advantage of. So we do read, um, we do read uh, all text communications between companies and customers, and we are able to run that through our sentiment analysis engine to decide whether the, the, the interactions are in a positive or a negative nature, and we do track that over time. So we're able to see if the customer has been uh, historically happy with that company and recently unhappy, and then perhaps do something from a marketing perspective to nurture that customer. So we are, we are totally taking advantage of, uh, of that coupled with CSAT. So when you couple uh, CSAT, which is what customers tell you, versus, NPS, versus um, NLP, which is, which is uh, us reading their, their communications and interpreting mm -hmm. it, we're able to get the full picture of that customer. Many notable investors, Tiger Global Management for one. What is the most asked question you've gotten from investors this year? Well, they're very, very focused on the opportunity in front of us. With the TAM, the total addressable market for the space we're in, is, is very large and, and growing rapidly. 
Um, so they want to understand how we are taking on, um, it's a David and Goliath story, so they want to understand how we're taking on Salesforce and Zendesk and how our product differentiates. And frankly, it's far more modern. Uh, many people have told us that if Salesforce or Zendesk were to build their products today, this is how they would build it without technical debt. So what they're fascinated on is, is um, because it is such a large opportunity, are we the right company to take those companies on? And, and I think based on the roster of investors we've, we've gotten, I think the answer is yes. Customers, Brad Birnbaum, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. And still ahead, will the UK election resolve the Brexit uncertainty and how may it affect its tech industry? That's next. This is Bloomberg. The European Union has vowed to rethink how regulators weigh mega deals. The changes are aimed at tackling how digital firms are dominating overseas markets and how European customers are willing to look for suppliers outside their home country. Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo reports from Brussels. Margaret Vestager, the European Commission's Technology and Competition Czar, will review the way EU antitrust regulators weigh industries. That is following criticism that she was too rigid fining Google and blocking telecom deals. Now, Vestager, who is best known for fining big American companies, said that she wants to update rules that go back two decades. Speaking in Brussels, she said digital companies had created an earthquake in Europe, and the new challenges mean the new European Commission will have to use different tools. Now, regulators will aim to look at the way companies operate, but also the way customers interact with them and, most crucially, whether or not they're able to find other alternatives. By the way, she cited the case of Google's Android and Apple's iOS system. In that case, the European Commission ruled that Google's dominant position was not challenged by Apple because of the pricing. Maria Tadeo, Bloomberg News, Brussels. And with just days to the UK election, opinion polls show Boris Johnson's Conservative Party is on course to win a majority, which would pave the way for a Brexit vote in Parliament by January 31st. For insight into how all of this could affect the region's tech sector, we're joined by Alistair Mitchell of EQT Ventures. It's the venture capital arm of Swedish, Swedish company EQT Partners. If we were to face a Brexit, which we think that we've been getting for multiple years, how does that change the tech sector in hiring? Well, first of all, it's great to be here and talking about this. This is a subject that UK founders, entrepreneurs and investors talk almost nonstop about or have done because you said it's been going on for a long time. I mean, the honest answer is that I think everyone's realized that no matter what happens in the election, um, there's going to be continued uncertainty, right? Even if it goes the Conservatives' way, there's going to be, there has to be a deal sorted and a deal hammered out. And then we all know from the previous deal, quote unquote, that there was many years of a, a transition between, you know, a full European framework to one where the UK plays a minor or a lesser or greater part. Has this uncertainty weighed on business sentiment, consumer sentiment, yeah, or tech sector? Yeah, absolutely it has, and, and, and especially in the tech sector, right, which is um, very fast growing um, and relies a lot on uh, cross-cultural, cross-country talent and investment. So for sure, over the last two, three years, there's been an awful lot of uncertainty in London. There have been funds that tried to raise that weren't able to raise from LPs. There have been LPs that can no longer invest in UK funds. Um, there have been companies that might have started off in London starting somewhere else. So there's been a lot of uncertainty. Now that hasn't hurt Europe. In fact, Europe as a whole has, has done very well um, in the growth in tech and investment over the last few months. The last quarter, 8.7 billion euros invested in European startups, which is a massive record. And this year has already beaten last year, even before the end of Q4, on how much is invested in Europe. But it has meant that Lon what, what London perhaps would have taken a, a bigger share of has now flown to other places like Paris or Berlin. And that's where I wanted to ask, as an investor, are you more comfortable going to other cities in Europe to get away from the uncertainty in London? So we're a European fund. We invest in European startups going international and US startups going into Europe. And then we just raised 700 and almost three quarters of a billion dollars to invest in European startups and US startups going into Europe. So we're huge believers. But it does mean we look across Europe, right? We, whereas before, maybe 50% of the deals were in London and the rest were spread out across everywhere else. Now you're seeing a much bigger spread into the big, the big hubs, which are Paris and Berlin, but also across Europe, across into Eastern Europe. It's much more localized. Lots more startups stay 
staying where they are because of the, the talent that you've got there and the rise of investors looking not just in one or two locations. Have you had to look at visas, tech visas in London, how to get those and then basically how you hire talent there? We have the luxury of looking across Europe, and we're not the only ones. Actually, 40% of that last record quarter of, of startup funding in Europe came from US and Asian um, funds, which is a record. So more and more of the big name US VCs are all piling into Europe. Now, they are st starting to locate in London simply because of geographical and language is probably still the place they're going to be, but they're looking across Europe. Now, for us, it's OK. We can find the best startups. But for a startup, and I founded four before joining as, a, as an investor, yeah, you care a lot about visas. And the bet, really, for, for UK-based startups is that there will be some form of visa passport that will still make it very easy to bring in amazing talent or, frankly, the rise of remote working, you can have teams sitting in local countries um, starting from wherever you are. EQT Ventures, Alistair Mitchell, thank you for joining us. Thanks Brexit Nina. story and the tech story folding into one. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at Quick Take on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.